Okay, I guess we can start with the, the third lecture by Enrico Payer about inflation. Good afternoon, everyone. So again, we're going to pick up from where we left. And that was, uh, we'd spend some time understanding the inflationary background. It means uh, it's pretty much a quasi the sitter background as far as gravity is concerned. And as far as the scalar field is concerned, uh, so this was uh, pretty much a sitter metric. And then a scalar field that moves slowly. I guess that's the background, and we want to know what happens uh, for per, uh, to perturbations on top of this background. And so we, we introduce some formalism, and a lot of that formalism was also discussed by Raphael. And I think we are both using more or less denotations in uh, Weinberg's book. So that's, if, if you don't know what some of the letters are, that's where you can find it. But uh, let me just remind you, we, we use a couple of tricks. We use the, uh, the scalar vector tensor decomposition. Because we're going to work only at linear order. So, well, for most, for today's lecture, it's only linear order. And so I can't forget about vectors and tensors when I study the scalars and, and vice versa. So I'm, I'm going to start studying the scalars. Uh, and then we said we really want to work in Fourier space because that's uh, where all modes uh, decouple. And so, I argue, or actually I showed you, that the metric, the perturbations to the metric, they have four scalars in them, scalars under special rotation. So there was one here in the zero, zero component that I was calling minus E, and there is another one here in the zero I component that I was calling A, D, I, F, and finally there were two in the special component that I was calling A squared a delta ij plus di dj b. One, two, three, four scalars. This is as far as gr is concerned. And then we have a scalar field, right? So there are also perturbations to the scalar field. Just to remind you, my notation is that there is some background. And this is uh, the perturbation is what we are studying. So we have a total of five scalar fields. One, two, three, four, five. Um, what we discuss is that uh, gauge invariance uh, is something that you have to deal with. Otherwise, if you find a solution, you don't know if it is a physical one. Maybe you could gauge it away and make it equivalent to no solution. So you can work in two ways. Either you work with gauge invariant variables or you just fix the gauge. It's somewhat simpler to fix the gauge, so that's what I'm going to do, but I'm going to say a couple of words about gauge invariant variables as well. And we argue that fixing the gauge just means uh, considering a gauge transformation with some uh, arbitrary set of four functions here. And two of those four functions uh, transform like a scalar under the scalar vector tensor decomposition, in particular the zero one and the longitudinal part of the, um, of the spatial. Sorry for this symbol, I just never learned to, to draw xi, but, but that's, that's what it, xi is according to me. Okay, so now this is an arbitrariness of the theory, so I can use it to get rid of two of the scalars. Okay, and of course there are many options, there are five scalars and two functions, so I can decide which one to kill. And the most useful uh, gauges, well in cosmology there are many, <laughs> there is the Newtonian gauge, um, in Newtonian gauge, what we are getting rid of is F equals B equals zero. I'm just killing two of them. Another one is what Raphael was telling you about. That's the one he's using is E equals F equals zero. That's the one in which everyone has the same clocks. And these are very useful in cosmology, but perhaps more useful in uh, kind of late universe cosmology when you do inflation. There are two other choices that are a bit more, uh, more useful, and these are called um, flat gauge. And flat gauge, as you might guess, 
is when I put the special part, specially flat gauge, maybe that's, that's the full name. Let's not use any jargon here. Specially flat. And you can imagine is when I get rid of all the perturbation in the spatial part of the matrix, so it's really flat. That means uh, uh, A equals B equals zero. And finally, um, well, you can come up with all kinds of things, but these are the two most useful when you do inflation. The other is called co-moving gauge. Uh, and that's when you do phi equals... Um, I equals B equals zero. Okay, so all kind of uh, nomenclature, not so important. We're going to use uh, <coughs> <coughs> most of the time we're going to use this co-moving one in the calculation. But you just know that you have a ton, a ton of options. And it might not be obvious why this is called co-moving age, but if you were to work things out, you would find that uh, phi is proportional to the perturbations to the velocity if we were to describe this one as a fluid. So setting five to zero somewhat means that we go co-moving with the fluid. And that, that's why it's called co-moving. You can just take it as a name. Okay, so these are all kinds of choices. We will play around with the last two. Um, okay, so can I define something which is gauge invariant? Well, for sure, I told you how well, how the metric changes is just changes with the lead derivative in the direction of the transformation. So you know how it changes, and you just build things such that the, 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 the transformation of every term cancels the other. Okay, so you just play around with it, and you find two interesting, in fact, you can define, of course, infinitely many gauge invariant variables, but two of them are particularly interesting, and we're going to use them over and over. In fact, this one I used all the time. In fact, I just figured out how to solve my notation issue. I'm going to indicate the rich scalar as rich. And so every time I write R, you know I'm talking about the gauge invariant perturbation. So there is no confusion. Um, small technological advancement here. Uh, OK, so this is one variable. and. Uh, what you can check is that if you go get, do a gauge transformation, you know that the metric transforms with the lead derivative, so you know how A transforms. Scalar field also transforms with the lead derivative in a different way. You put all of these things together, you see this is gauge invariant, uh, with, with one specification to be made in a second. And there is another thing, that another game you can play. Still start with the same A, but now you subtract some other quantity. That's a row over row dot. H. In fact, if you didn't have a scalar field, here you would just write delta U, and this would be valid for any fluid. Since I have a scalar field, I have specified it to the scalar field. Both of these choices are gauge invariant, and they're two different variables. Well, they come on different lines. This letter here is a zeta. I also don't know how to, to, to write that one, but that's my symbol for zeta. And they have names. Uh, the names are Curvature, perturbations, both of them are cur curvature perturbations. On, this one is called co-moving hyperslices. And this one is called on, uh, um, um, on f uh, what is this called one? On uh, constant... Uh, Constant density hyper. Okay, so the reason, well, the reason maybe is obvious from the name. It means that you can think of this variable as a curvature perturbation if you restrict it to hypersurfaces which are co-moving. Being co-moving means delta u is zero, so this term is zero. When this term is zero, r is precisely a up to a factor of two. And A is indeed what appears in the spatial part of the metric. So that's what's going to make your metric look uh, open or closed in different parts of the universe differently. Okay, so it looks like a curvature, a spatial curvature perturbation. And the same for the second one. If you choose a gauge in which delta rho equals zero, well, this looks like a curvature perturbation on, on that hyperslice.
And I don't know if everyone is familiar with changing gauges and getting rid of variables. So maybe it's obvious for everyone, but I thought I would just do a drawing. I always find it a useful drawing. Uh, suppose that you have some variable, phi, it doesn't matter what variable it is, as a function of x. And that variable, uh, well, it's just not homogeneous. At different points in x, it takes different values. Okay, so the idea is that, oh, well, let me take, uh, let me redefine my coordinates such that my new x prime is going to be just parallel to this. So this is going to be variable x prime. Clearly, if I w make the same plot in variable x primes, uh, well, the field will look straight. So I, I've gotten rid of the perturbations by changing what I call x. So that, okay, this is very sketchy, but it's just to give you some intuition of how comes that uh, I can get rid of variables by changing uh, coordinates. And I mean, you can do some more refined version of this, of this picture. Any, any questions about this? Uh, H transformations. Uh, yeah, I think all of these are good. Yeah, I think any, I don't have a, yeah, any choice is, uh, is fine. It just, it depends on, well, we, we will see why these gauges are useful in a second. But no, any choice, you can, in fact, some people even just work directly with the gauge invariant so they don't have uh, to make a gauge choice. Yeah, no, it's just a matter of algebra. And since I'm not doing all the algebra on the board, it actually doesn't matter that much what gauge I choose, but I just wanted to tell you in what gauge this formula are gonna be true. When you actually have to do the calculation yourself, you wanna choose the right gauge, or you will be sorry. Um, okay, so there is a, uh, well, it has been known for quite a while that these variables have the property, so these are fields, right? So, so this R is a function of X and T, and so it's Xi, and so they have, uh, uh, little brothers or cousins uh, that live in Fourier space, say the node with the same variable. There are equivalent descriptions. Uh, and for a long time, it has been known that in a set of, uh, of cases, for example, gravity plus a single field, these variables have the properties of being constant in time uh, as long as k is much smaller than a h. So on super, uh, on super Hubble scales. And this is known in, in, a, in a set of uh, specific solutions, but there is a nice general argument of why this has to be the case. Um, and that argument is due to Weinberg, actually it's a theorem. Weinberg's theorem that proves this fact in quite some generality. And I thought I would at least tell you what this uh, theorem is about. Well, the theorem actually proves exactly this, proves that well, this variable and this variable um, are constant on scales that are super Hubble. In fact, one thing that I could have done here, uh, I'm gonna prove it only for one of the two variables, but what you can prove is that R is related to zeta plus a term which is of order k squared not actually a h squared, but is of, of, in this schematic discussion that we have here is going to be the difference between these two. You can use the equation of motion to evaluate it, and you find that it's of order k over a h. So on super Hubble scales, these two quantities are actually the same one on the equation of motion, and so if one is conserved, clearly the other is conserved. So most of this lecture, I always talk about this variable. But okay, I could talk about zeta as well, but I'm just gonna talk about R. So uh, now, yes. Yeah, I'm only talking about linear order perturbation theory. Yeah, nothing beyond linear order. Beyond the linear order, I have to define these variables in a way that is gauging, this is only gauge invariant at linear order. And uh, the gauge invariant definition just for the expert of, uh, of R beyond the linear order is the perturbations to the local number of E-foldings. So if you want to go beyond the linear order, that's the gauge invariant. Uh, I mean, that's something you can measure locally, and everything you can measure is gauge invariant because 
Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to measure it. In fact, that's called delta n formalism, and maybe we will discuss it at some point. But uh, coming back to our story, what this Weinberg theorem is saying, well, it's saying that uh, indeed, no matter what the constituents of the universe are, so I don't have to assume the single field, multiple field, radiation, matter, all you want, you can just put in. There is always uh, one, there, is al there always exists a solution in which uh, R of k is constant, indeed for k much smaller than a h. And the way that, um, and what, what, is, what does this solution look like? I have to tell you more specifically what it looks like. So that's, that's what I'm gonna write, uh, do right now. So he, he actually tell you what the solution is. So he tells you the solution is given by, and he gives you this specific solution in one particular gauge, and he finds it convenient to do it in Newtonian gauge. But we know that R is gauge invariant. So as I show it in Newtonian gauge, and I find that R is constant, then it's just always true because it's gauge invariant. And you find this uh, beautiful solution that I write down for a reason that will be uh, clear in a second. So he finds the solution for all the fields uh, that we had in the problem. And actually, he can find the solution without solving the equation. So that's why it's, it's nice. And the solution is given by this formula. Uh, e and A are this. Uh, and then every scalar, so uh, the perturbation to any scalar divided by the, scale, by the time derivative of the scalar. So this is a generic notation to say, for example, delta rho over rho dot or delta p over p dot. Any scalar you have, all the scalars have the same perturbations. Okay, and what is that? That's another formula. It is minus R um, over A integral A in DT. Now, all these things have the property that now if I combine those two, sol those two parts of the solution using, for example, this formula and remembering that phi is a scalar, indeed I'll find R. It all makes sense as a, as a solution. Um, what does this tell us physically? Well, it tells us the following thing, that if we again plot on the uh, moving distances on the vertical axis, for example, um, this is the co-moving uh, Hubble radius, and we have a phase of inflation, and if in which, uh, of course, is accelerated expansion, and then a phase of decelerated expansion, for example, radiation domination, matter domination, and eventually we are living here during dark energy. Uh, okay, so if we have this picture, and we take one physical perturbation, let's denote it, well, one co-moving perturbation, let's denote it by k, as long as that k is on scales that are bigger than this uh, co-moving Hubble radius, it is constant. This actually finally tells us why uh, inflation is, is a bridge across energy scales. is because uh, it doesn't change in time from the very early universe until now, or as long as it is on super Hubble scales. So somehow this connects the physics at these energy scales, which are probably much larger because the energy density always decreases with the expansion, with something we can measure much later at much lower energy scales. And if you remember, maybe here we can go as large as 10 to the 16 for energy density, and while today is 10 to the 16, sorry, GV to the fourth, while today is 10 to the minus three EV to the fourth. Okay, so this, this, is, the, uh, this is the whole trick. This is why inflation, uh, this is why cosmology talk to high energy physicists uh, one of the reasons, there are also other reasons, but I like to go for a coffee, for example. Okay, some, some questions. I haven't proven it yet, but. Okay, then maybe I say, oh yes. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. I haven't proven it yet. Now I'm going to tell you why it's constant. This is just the statement and what it means. 
and there is a proof, and the proof is beautiful per se, and it's worth understanding it, uh, but we don't have enough time to go through it, unfortunately. So I'm going to give you a sketch of what the steps are of the proof without actually doing the calculation. I originally wanted to do it, but I think it's more fun to, for you to see a little bit of a few more topics in the field rather than a very detailed uh, proof. And so the proof goes as follows. Um, step number one, make a gauge <laughs> transformation. Um, that doesn't vanish at special infinity. Okay, you can always choose Xi there, change your coordinates in such a way that this one doesn't go to, to zero. When I told you that this is gauge invariant here, I should have specified that this is gauge invariant uh, only if this gauge transformation does go to zero. at spatial infinity. So as long as you do a gauge transformation that vanishes at spatial infinity, this is indeed gauge invariant. But if it doesn't vanish at spatial infinity, that's really something wild that you're doing to the theory, because you're saying that things that are arbitrarily far away have arbitrarily large perturbation in some sense. Then, then this doesn't vanish, and actually you can see that this is a generated variation of R. This R in particular will have zero momentum. Uh, well, because it doesn't vanish at infinity. Then step number two is that you, uh, you solve the GR equations of motion and prove that delta R survives when K is different from zero but very small. Goes to zero but different from zero. And so you find that this gauge solution actually becomes a physical solution and extends to finite momentum. Just for the people that come from field theory, this is the same that you do to prove that uh, there is um, a Goldstone boson. Well, both steps. Prove that if, if there is a symmetry, then there is a particle associated to the spontaneously breaking of that symmetry, and that's the Goldstone boson. Actually, for that case, uh, it, it, there is no equation that you have to check. Why, for gravity, you do have to check an extra equation. And finally, that's the proof. Um, okay, so it's very undetailed, but for those of you that are interested, the paper is by Weinberg in, I think, 2003. So from now on, I'm just going to assume that you know that this R and this zeta are constant on super Hubble scales. Another way for checking it is that you just take GR, Einstein equation, plus scalar field equation, you put in a constant and you see that they indeed are solved. Okay, that's uh, a simple way of doing it and you will see that indeed they are solved. Actually, there is another quantity that is, um, another conserved quantity, the last one. Well, actually not the last one. The last relevant one for inflation. And this is Dij. Dij of K is also constant up to terms that goes like k over a h <laughs> square. So not only these curvature perturbations are constant, but also the, the gravitational, the tensor, uh, the gravitons perturbations. So this was the, the transverse traceless part. I think Michele was calling it, uh, well, I don't know, you can call it this gamma plus cross. Well, there are many different notations. This is the, the, the graviton in the metric. They are also constant on super Hubble scales. And the proof is exactly the same. Do a gauge transformation, see that uh, it solves the equation when Q is finite. Okay, so there are two things that we can measure about the early universe without really bothering about what happened in between. One are these scalars R and the other are these uh, tensor modes. Those are the primordial gravitational waves that perhaps were produced during inflation. So the rest of the lecture, we are going to compute what those are. And we are very happy about the computation done on this very left-hand side of the drawing, because we know that when we compute it here, it's going to be constant all the way until uh, Raphael tells me how to observe it in the CMB. OK, so that's, that's the, where the trick is.
And there was one specific reason why I wrote um, why I wrote that solution. And I, I, I want to give you some physical intuition for <coughs> for what that solution is. Um, that solution, that R equal constant solution, the scalar, is not the most generic uh, scalar uh, solution that you can find, scalar thing that you can find. In particular, as you can see from there, it has the very specific property that for every constituent of the universe, delta rho over rho dot, this is the background, this is the perturbation, for every i and j, where i and j could be dark matter, photons, baryons, um, dark energy, um, neutrinos, and so on and so forth. Everything that makes up this universe have the same perturbations as long as you write it under this ratio. This is a, a very specific uh, uh, way to start a universe. In principle, you could say, imagine that the universe is some complicated place. Here you could say, I put a lot of neutrinos and a few gammas. And you could say that every, every component of the universe has its own initial conditions that are independent from each other. This would have been a reasonable way to start the universe. This is not what we observe, and we will see this is not what's predicted from inflation. What we actually observe is that each one of these is exactly the same as long as you write it under this combination. That's a remarkable fact about our universe, actually. And this is true on very large scales. And this thing has a name, the name of this very specific combination in which each one comes with, its, with the same ratio. is called adiabatic mode. And in some, uh, yes. In single field, we know, uh, we know why this uh, comes about. I mean, you might ask, uh, do we know the, the origin of the adiabatic mode? This is something just that you observe. This is a statement based on CMB and large scale structure. You, you see it. Uh, do we have a good explanation? Well, in single field inflation, we do have an explanation why is, uh, the adiabatic mode comes about. Because we have single field inflation. So we have just uh, this scalar field that has perturbations. Weinberg tells me that there is always a solution that looks like this. So the solution of the scalar field has to become this solution. And this solution is adiabatic. So in single field, in some sense, the universe was adiabatic from the very beginning because there was only one scalar field. This one froze outside of the Hubble radius, and it was adiabatic at late times when we measure it. That's one possible explanation. We don't know if that is the origin of adiabaticity in the universe. It could be that the early universe was multi-field inflation. And maybe I'll come. And then adiabaticity comes, out, comes about in a very different way through thermalization. And I'll maybe mention that later. But now let's move on and compute something. Uh, so as it, as it is well known, we cannot predict what R of x is uh, from our theories. Because our theories, they're all, uh, well, they're diff invariant, the theory itself, without the initial condition. So it's not going to tell me that R takes a specific value here rather than here. No, it's all invariant under translation, for example. So the theory is not going to predict that. As Raphael also discussed in the CMB, what the theory is really going to predict are correlations. Uh, and for example, the simplest correlation you can think about is you take two, two points, same time or different time, doesn't matter, and then you do this correlation. Now, the theory can tell you this. You can think of this as a quantum mechanical correlator, and, and that's something that we can uh, compare with experiments. So these are the quantities that we're going to try to compute. And just to set my notation, this one for me is always this conventional factor of 2 pi cubed delta d of k. Oh, sorry, if I write it in, uh, in Fourier space. So much so that sometimes I will just put a little prime to skip all of this 2 pi cube delta because it's obvious it's always there. And I'll just put a prime so I don't have to write it down. And this is what we call the power spectrum. So this will be the typical thing that we will try to compute. And we will compute it both for the scalars and for the tensor because those are the two quantities that are conserved. I could compute it for some other quantity that is not conserved. 
But then what I do with it? I cannot compare it with observation because it might change in time between inflation and now. So that prediction is not useful for any observer. So, so let's compute. <laughs> Let's compute this two-point function. There, there is a lot of beautiful prose that goes together with the computation of this two-point function. I'm going to reserve that prose for the end of the discussion. First, I'm going to give you the dry mathematics. And as a warm-up, we're going to compute this quantity from quantum mechanics. So just let's refresh everyone's memory on how to quantize uh, things. And since quantizing... Uh, zero plus one dimensional field, that is quantum mechanics is easier than quantizing fields. I'm gonna just do very quickly the quantization of the simple, the good old simple harmonic oscillator. And then we will see that that is uh, very analogous to the quantization of, of R itself, with just some small modification. The only interesting thing about this, which probably you haven't seen uh, in quantum mechanics, is the fact that I'm gonna quantize this uh, simple harmonic oscillator allowing for time-dependent um, <coughs> frequency. Factor of two here, I think. Okay, so this, I'm gonna quantize this theory. X is just the position of the harmonic oscillator, and you, you guys all know how to quantize it. I first find a, um, a conjugate variable, which is just X dot. <coughs> And then I impose the canonical commutation relations. I put a little hat, so this x becomes an operator, and so does p. In fact, p, we already compute what it is, is x dot. And I impose this to be i uh, h bar. <coughs> you know there is an i here, because if you do the dagger on the left, these guys are self-adjoint, so they switch, so you get the minus sign, and you do get the minus sign on the right-hand side. Uh, okay, so we know that quantizing it, it's always easier if we introduce these uh, uh, ladder operators, good old A and A dagger, and those are the operators, and we put some time-dependent uh, coefficient in front of them. Um, oh, I have to tell you what the equation of motion are. You know the equation of motion, it's a harmonic oscillator. The equation of motion in particular is real. So if I take the complex conjugate of this equation, uh, well, it remains itself. That means that the two solutions of this equation are V and its complex conjugate. And these are the two solutions that I had here. So I know that I'm capturing both possible initial conditions. Okay, well, the only thing that I do is that I plug this ANSATS inside my condition for the quantization and I see what comes out. And what comes out is this. So you take care of all the eyes. This thing has to be one. I just put the IH on the other side for simplicity. Okay, so this makes sense. In, in fact, when I, when I give you this... Uh, way to write x. I haven't told you the relative normalization between v and a. So I can always take v and, and put a factor of 37 and take it out on a. So it was not well defined unless I tell you how I normalize them. One useful way to normalize them is to say, well, a a dagger, I'm just going to take this one to be 1. Good way to remember is 1 and not an i is that you take the dagger again. And you don't get an I because this one switched, but then get a dagger, so this remains invariant, like the right hand side. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the first thing we do. Uh, that fixes uh, one initial condition. Then, and that fixes the normalization, 
but that's still not enough to tell me what the full solution is. So in particular, now I'm considering a situation in which omega is a time-dependent function. If omega is a time-dependent function, there is not well-defined way to say what the vacuum of this harmonic oscillator is. The reason is that the, the background is time-dependent and can move what we mean by the vacuum as time goes by. So there is not a well-defined prescription to choose a vacuum. There are interesting cases in which as time, for example, goes to minus infinity, omega becomes a constant. We will see that this is what happens for perturbations in our universe. That is an interesting case because then I can quantize it uh, far in the past when I know what, uh, that omega was constant, so I know what the right vacuum is, and then I just evolved it forward from there. So that is going to be the trick that we're going to use. So when A of minus infinity, which is a constant, I'm going to call this constant uh, omega of minus infinity. Well, uh, I mean, I don't even call it that, it's just, it's a constant. And then I finally know what uh, the, the solution of, the, of this harmonic oscillator is. The normalization I already knew from this condition, and therefore there is a factor of h bar and a factor of two omega. What I didn't know is whether this exponential has a plus or a minus i omega t. This would be, corresponds to the two possible choices of the vacuum here, but when I take the omega to be constant, then I know what the right solution is. That's the standard one that I find in quantum mechanics and is what I call the positive frequency. That's indeed the one that minimizes uh, uh, the Hamiltonian, which is a well-defined uh, time evolution operator when omega is constant. And the, right, and the right solution is with a minus here. That's one way to remember that minus is because the uh, Schrodinger equation is plus i d in dt of psi. So maybe that's a way to remember it. Okay, so this is the right solution, uh, the right normalization for this, uh, for this harmonic oscillator. Well, and now, just to show you why, why I did all of this work, I'm able to tell you where, where the harmonic oscillator is in average. No? Now I can compute very easily quantities like this. And of course, the result is gonna be v squared. So what did it take? Well, it took uh, two, two inputs, <laughs> the choice of a vacuum here and the choice of a normalization here. So I'm going to try to do the same for perturbations, quantum perturbations to this curvature in our universe. And eventually, I'm going to compute the power spectrum of curvature. So this was just an analogy. Let's do this more complicated calculation. So this was quantum mechanics. Um, <coughs> and now we're going to go to quantum field theory, which if you want is an integral in D3K of quantum mechanics, in some sense. Well, we know what the action that we wanted to quantize was, so there are a few more complications that I'm gonna discuss as, as I go along. And I thought it's better to tell you that these complications exist uh, rather than not mention them at all, even though I don't have time to discuss them in details. So I'm going to just mention some of the subtleties in the calculation in words. So this is the action that we wanted to start with. This action is nonlinear. Well, there is a square root of g that I forgot. For one thing, v is a nonlinear function. Square root of g times this is nonlinear. This times this. Is, so it's a whole nonlinear thing. And we are only able to quantize linear things. So first thing we have to do is we need to expand this to, uh, well, sorry, it's, it's, it's non-quadratic. So we want to find the, the quadratic part of it. There will be a cubic part of it and so on and so forth. For the quantization, we are going to start with the non-interacting part of the theory, which is just the quadratic one that leads to linear equations of motion. Uh, how, do we compute, uh, how do we compute S2? Um, First of all, we need to rewrite this action in a better way. So a couple of days ago, uh, I think Raphael asked how many people derived the, the Einstein equations from the Einstein-Hilbert action, no? and a lot of you raised your hands. But could you find the Einstein equation varying the Einstein-Hilbert action? You shouldn't have been able to. Yeah, it's not. The, the Einstein equations do not come from the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action because this one contains a double time derivatives of the metric. 
And those you don't know what to do when you do a variation. They're just not, not well defined in the variational principle. So actually, the only, unless you, probably you were neglecting some boundary terms, but the correct way to actually find Einstein equation is to put this, uh, uh, this boundary term. I'm not going to discuss it very much, except for telling you the name of this boundary term, which is York, uh, Gibbons, and Hawking. Then if you put this boundary term, then you do indeed find Einstein, the correct Einstein equations. Uh, maybe another way of saying it is that this is some second, when we do quantized scalar fields, we never have a second time derivatives in the action. No? Even when you do Lagrangian mechanics, you do Q dot square, you don't do Q double dot. Okay? So this action is not written in that way because it has G double dot. So you don't know what to do. So let's rewrite this action in a way that there is only G dot, only first derivative of the metric appearing and then we, it will be easier to deal with it. One formalism to do that is the ADM formalism. Well, actually, there is much more to the ADM formalism than what I would be able to say today. Today, I'm just going to talk about the ADM choice of variables, if you want. That's the first step of the formalism. That is the suggestion of, let's write the most generic metric. Forget about that parameterization, just the most generic one. And let it, let's write it this way. Um, okay, this is as generic as the previous one. It just have uh, 10 components. Just now I'm calling, uh, perhaps in a more schematic way, and this is very schematic because I don't remember it by heart, but somehow here there is an N, and I appears uh, here, and then I appears here, and this is H. Okay, somehow I've given special names to the component that appear in the 0, 0, and 0, I part of the metric for a reason that will become uh, clear in a second. Anyways, this is the, the, the definition. I can always uh, choose this parameterization. What's beautiful about that is that now I can rewrite uh, the full action, including the boundary term, in this uh, perhaps not so compact, well, definitely less compact than square root of gr, but perhaps easier to work with. Uh, form. And I thought that's, I mean, if you do inflation and perturbation, you should see this at least once, because this is really the way it is done in pretty much all papers. So it's, it's good to have, to be exposed to it at least once. Even though I understand that it's a lot of, uh, of notation here that I'm adding, I think you hear, you hear the words. Okay, so this is the action. It's the same as, as that one with the boundary term. This is what it looks like when you write it in terms of the variables n, i, n, and h. This is what it looks like. I haven't told you what e is. e is pretty much up to a factor of n, the extrinsic curvature of the constant time hypersurface. So if I put t equal constant, there is this thing. And that has some uh, intrinsic and extrinsic curvature. The extrinsic curvature, damn it. I haven't written it down, so let's see if I get lucky. I think it's like this, maybe up to a factor of one half and a minus sign. Uh, yes. Oh, this is a number three. I'm going to discuss it. Uh, so okay. R rich three is equal Ricci of HIJ. Since HIJ is a three-dimensional metric, you should take Ricci only of that three-dimensional spatial metric. Notice that this thing will only have uh, <laughs> spatial derivatives of, uh, G I, of HIJ, only spatial derivatives. So there is no time derivative in this part. The all time derivative, which is what we were worried about there, all of the time derivative in this whole story only appear here. This is what now you can think of as being the kinetic term for gravity. 
or uh, HIJ. And indeed, as promised, now there is only the first time derivative of H appearing, and it's H dot square. Very similar to when you have a scalar field, it's phi dot square. Now, this is a well-defined action to do variational principle over. The scalar field, well, nothing happened. That was okay by its own, so I didn't do anything here. Uh, okay, so, so that's how you do this calculation. The other beautiful thing about this uh, notation, besides the fact that at least now you can do the variation very well, is notice the fact that N and I appear without time derivatives. They just know we are a time derivative of N or NI. In that sense, N and NI are not dynamical degrees of freedom of the metric. In fact, that had to be the case because of the femorphism invariance. Uh, and there is a beautiful one-line proof of this based just on uh, the Bianchi identity, but I'll, I'll do it some other time. So the fact that they appear without derivatives, they're not dynamical, it means that their equation of motion, I can just solve them once and for all at the beginning and they're always gonna be true. Uh, so they are, in some sense, n is really a Lagrange multiplier. n doesn't appear with any derivative, right? It's just algebraically, n to the minus one, n to the minus one, n, n. So I can just calculate what it is by solving its equation and plugging it back in. The procedure of solving n and comma n i as a function of the remaining degrees of freedom in the metric and whatever other uh, thing you have in the theory, for example, the scalar field, this is called solving the constraints. So sometimes I will use uh, this uh, slang word. in the sense that their equation of motion are non-dynamical, they are constrained equation. And by solving the constraint, I mean compute the equation of motion for n and ni, solve them, put it back into the equation so that the equation, the action will be only an action for h and, and let's say phi, and no n and ni anymore. Okay, that's more easily said than done, but luckily someone did it for us. You know. <laughs> Generically, it cannot be uh, done to all orders. Um, so in some limit, it can. But we only care about the quadratic part of the action. And that surely we can do. And I'm going to write down what the solution is for the quadratic part of the action. After I solve these constraints, the action now all depends on the spatial part of Hij and phi. And I told you that the, here, I actually only care about this, uh, the A part and the B part, the two scalars, right? I didn't care about the vectors and the tensors. Uh, and then here there is phi. And then I'm gonna choose the gauge, uh, which I called co-moving gauge. in which I'm gonna say b equals zero, phi equals zero, and I just choose a, a catchy name for a, which is two r. Well, in this gauge, indeed, a is two r. So instead of taking this a all, all over, I just can call it r and I'm, I'm done for the day. Okay, so what is this action? Um, tricky because it doesn't have the one half, I think. No one half. Well, very simple. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't believe how many calculations you have to do to get, go from there to there because it's just so simple, but it all cancels out. Uh, and this is the solution. This is the quadratic part of the action for gravity plus a scalar field in this particular gauge after I solve for the constraint. Indeed, this is an action that actually, written like this, is only an action for R. Single, a single scalar degree of freedom, and that's the curvature perturbation that we measure in our universe today because they are conserved on super Hubble scales. So this is exactly the, the, the quantity we want to quantize and compute the power spectrum of. Okay, some, some questions perhaps.
Oh, what is this epsilon? Very good. This is the slow roll parameter. H dot over H squared. And in fact, I should have commented on this action. It's very simple. It's actually just the action of a scalar field. So at the scalar field, you would do the same. This is just d mu r, d mu r, no? Because the, the metric is a Feller W, so I get a 1 over a squared on the spatial part of the metric. No, this, this quantity here is just. Except that there is a time-dependent function in front of it. Okay, so it's almost uh, just a canonically normalized uh, innocuous scalar field except for that epsilon. Not too bad. Someone else? A oh, very good question. Well, Epsilon knows about it, because in principle, Epsilon knows about the whole dynamics, and so it knows about the whole shape of the potential, because how much, how fast you go, how slow you go, depends on the shape of the potential. But that includes the couplings? No, the couplings are not included yet, and those will be clearly here in all of these terms. And next lecture, we will talk about cubic couplings, we will not do this calculation at cubic order and then at quartic order, and I'll show you the result. So there is a lot more information there. Very good, yeah. And maybe it's, it's worth mentioning that when epsilon goes to zero, exact the sitter, this mode doesn't exist. A little bit by definition of the sitter, no? there is no way to, to really slice it in a meaningful way uh, with time hypersurfaces. Something else? No, okay, well actually now it seems that it's gonna take us forever, but we are almost there with the, with the quantization because consider this, uh, this nifty change of variables. Consider now the variable suggestively called V that is A, A square root of two epsilon R. Actually for short, I'm gonna call A times square root of two epsilon Z. I think this is I don't know exactly who introduced it for the first time. It is often called the Mukhanov variables. I'm sure Slava used it in his original papers. I don't know if someone used it before him, actually. Uh, but it's a convenient variable. Why? Well, let's just try to rewrite this action using this variable. And this action now becomes... A, and we write it in uh, conformal time instead of um, uh, cosmic time. And now the primes denote derivative with respect to uh, conformal time. And this is what it looks like. Now you might not love it uh, yet, but in a second you will see that this is exactly a uh, uh, an integral in D3K over many harmonic oscillators. So let's go to Fourier space. Um, well, you, Fourier space is the usual one. Integral in D3K, e to the i kx, k. And now, um, well, if I do that, the equation of motion in Fourier space are going to be equal to Primes, they all denote the derivative with respect to conformal time. Okay, so this is very suggestive. It actually looks like a harmonic oscillator as, as long as you, uh, well, interpret this as your time-dependent frequency that you had before. Now we, we, have, we have been able to reduce this action to that of a sum of many harmonic oscillators. Uh, okay, so we do the quantization as we did before. The only thing that changes are these uh, factors of uh, this little labels k. So every k is one harmonic oscillator. Please appreciate the extremely subtle notation of sometimes k appearing with a vector and sometimes not. Uh, so this is the same quantization as we did before. Now this, this thing is a quantum field. Um, 
and its coefficient. Again, this is a real, uh, a real equation, so the solution are V and V star, the same equation, it's complex conjugate, and they're the solution of that equation. Um, notice that because the background is isotropic, this equation does not depend on K as a vector, but only on the norm of K, and therefore these mode functions only depend on the norm of K, while the actual quantum operator depends on the vector K. This one can actually create a perturbation in that direction, which is different at the quantum level from a perturbation in that direction, but their time evolution is gonna be the same as long as the norm is the same. Okay, and the last thing we wanna do is compute what this omega is and see if there is a time back in the past in which it was constant. That's what we relied on before. We need a time in which omega is constant and then we know what the vacuum is. And sure enough, that thing does happen in the past. Let's write what it is. It's k squared plus this uh, uh, z double prime over z. You know what z is, is this. So you take two time derivatives and compute it. And what it is, is 2ah uh, squared times one plus some corrections of order epsilon in eta that I don't write down. Uh, a couple of questions that if you're suspicious in my question, how, how come I can um, neglect these corrections? And at this point, I'm just going to tell you these are higher order in slow roll. There's a little bit more of a subtle discussion, but up to high, these are much smaller than one, so I can neglect them with respect to one. So this is an estimate of h squared. And you clearly see that uh, when k is much bigger than a h, well, this quantity is approximately uh, constant. It's just k squared. This means well inside the Hubble radius. Uh, so that if we were to draw it, and this would be one over uh, the commoving Hubble, that happens when the mode is really inside. So this is K much bigger than AH. As opposed to know when the mode freezes, which is when K is much smaller than uh, the commoving Hubble radius. Okay, so this is when we can find a good normalization for the initial condition, and we can define positive frequencies, and then we just follow the evolution, because we have the equation and we solve it. Yes? The vacuum will change. What, what, what happens is that when K is huge with respect to AH, then this is really an harmonic oscillator, it's just in, in Minkowski. In fact, we know that as, soon as, as long as you probe a universe on scales that are much smaller than its typical curvature, it's like being in this room. We, we don't really notice the expansion of the universe or the cosmological perturbations to gravity. So here we know that what particles are, we, we would all agree. We take this as initial condition and then we are gonna feed that initial condition into this equation. And this equation is gonna generate particle out of it, but this initial condition is gonna fix the, the overall coefficient in some sense. So maybe now I write the solution and so we can discuss the solution. Um, right. Well, the solution is the same as before. I just uh, mutatis mutandis. So it is e to the i k tau with a nice minus sign for positive frequency, the same we had before, divided by square root of 2k. This was uh, square root of 2 omega before. Now omega is k squared. This is early. This is early meaning uh, when k is much bigger than AH, and this is what you would call the vacuum in Minkowski space. In some sense, we are using the fact that on short scales, uh, space-time looks like Minkowski because you don't realize that you are in the sitter. You need to, be, to probe certain distances to realize you are in the sitter. Okay, very good. So this is the right um, 
the right initial condition. Now we want to find the solution of this equation with that initial condition. And okay, you can put it on Mathematica, in Mathematica, and then it might give you some Bessel function. And if you do full simplify, it will give you this nice solution. Okay, indeed, that's, pro oh, sorry, I, I wrote this in terms of uh, conformal time. It's, uh, it's useful to do, it's very easy. We know how conformal time is defined, but maybe it's not easy to solve this equation just by I, but I can tell you what the solution is. Tau is equal minus one over AH. So conformal time during inflation runs from minus infinity in the past to zero in the far future. Okay, so, so that teaches us the fact that k tau really means k over a h. So when k is much bigger than a h, this term is negligible. And indeed, you see that we, uh, we recover the initial condition that, that we imposed. So this is the right solution. And then we have the right frequency because we have this minus sign here. Uh, this thing is the sitter mode function. I'm going to mention a little bit later what happens when you want to include this as a lot of corrections. Okay, so well, that's pretty much everything we need. And now we finally can compute the two-point function, uh, the power spectrum of R. And there is, again, 2 pi cube delta function that's always there. But the interesting part, well, how do we, how do we compute it? Well, we remember that R is nothing but V divided by Z. Okay? So this thing is going to be 1 over Z squared. Um, but maybe I should do it more explicit. Let me do it more explicit so you see the, the creation and annihilation operator. The only part that survives of this operator, so this is an operator, of these operators is the, the VK, A dagger, this RK. Right, the other one annihilates the vacuum on this side. This one annihilates the vacuum on the other side. So this is the only one surviving. So clearly this one is 1 over Z squared norm of V squared. Um, okay, and what is that? Uh, well, Z squared is, uh, is that 2 epsilon A squared, and V squared is this quantity. But we are interested in this uh, not necessarily as a function of time, but as tau going to 0, or if you want to 0 minus. We want to we wanna know it in the far future. We want to know it when it becomes constant, and we said it becomes constant only when k is much smaller than a h. So that's when this term dominates. Before that, it's still evolving in time. We don't want to compute it when it's still evolving, because then it's still evolving, so we don't know what it is. We want to compute it when it reaches its asymptotic value. So that's when tau is equal to 0, and then that's <laughs> the second term. The exponential doesn't matter, because we're taking the norm. Uh, and so the result is h squared over 4 epsilon k cube. This is what we call the power spectrum of R. Okay. So let me give you in one minute the pros that goes, that goes with it. Um, we have some classical <laughs> background, and that's the sitter space-time that's inflating. Um, and then we have fields living on it. For example, the metric itself and the scalar field. Quantum mechanics tells me I cannot put them to zero. It's always moving a little bit because of the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle it was told me that this V cannot be zero and somehow set the normalization of V. This, this was coming from the uncertainty principle. And so I know that very locally on short scales, there is a little bit of ripples, and those are quantum mechanics uh, oscillations. As the universe expands, the wave wavelength becomes larger. The background is time dependent. If you, count, if you count the number of quanta, the number of quanta grows exponentially. 
And as they get to horizon size, the number of quanta is very large. So this perturbation behave effectively as physical perturbation. And when they are much larger than the Hubble radius, actually they, they become physical in this sense. There are a lot of quanta that make them up. So they don't look very, very quantized. No, they look smooth. Um, and so this particle has been really produced by uh, the expansion of the universe. And so this is uh, what inflation tells us is the prediction for uh, uh, what should happen to the, how the universe should start in terms of perturbations. As promised, there is this K cube here. In the first lecture, we described this K cube only comes from one of the isometries of the sitter space, this dilation. And that's indeed there. And then there is some coefficient. So the important thing is that this tells us the coefficient. Yes. Sorry, the zero point in the center space? Yeah, yeah. Yes, if I computed, uh, yeah, because that, that is in a UV divergence. Yeah, that is always there, because in the UV, it just looks like Minkowski. So yeah, the, the cosmological constant problem appears here as well. Yeah. I'm assuming that the potential is already, so he's asking about what happens to the cosmological constant problem, whether there, are, there is this uh, UV divergences in just the vacuum energy, and yes, that is really an ultraviolet problem, so it's present in, in every space time, because it really depends on very short scales, and on short scales, physics is always Minkowski, so yeah, that problem is present. And the assumption here is that that's somehow subtracted in the V, and there is some physical value for V that yeah, good. Some other question? So there are just two specifications that I have to make about this, this result. Number one is that we neglected this epsilon and eta corrections. Because of that, actually R, which is V divided by Z, is not really constant. I was cheating a little bit. Indeed, in the far future, if you do that ratio, this thing here wins. This one cancels the A in, in the Z, but there is still a square root of two epsilon. And epsilon changes in time a little bit, so it looks like R is not constant. The reason why it looks not constant is because I neglected these corrections. And I kept those corrections and, find, and found the more generic solution of this equation, keeping all of these terms, which is a generic uh, well, Bessel function or Hankel function with the right initial conditions, I would have found that indeed R is exactly a constant. So to make up for that mistake, I have to tell you when to evaluate these time-dependent functions, and you should evaluate them at Hubble crossing. The star means that you evaluate those quantities when k tau minus k tau equals one, or in other words, when a equals a h. So for every mode, k, okay, you evaluate this quantity at a time in which tau is equal minus one over k. Okay, then when that mode left the Hubble radius. So in some sense, in this expression is a little bit, uh, uh, it's a little bit subtle in the sense that you might ask, are there deviations in this expansion for an exactly scale invariant power spectrum, K cube? And there are some deviations, and they hide in the time dependence of this coefficient. For example, let's compute the, uh, this interesting but funnily defined parameter, NS minus 1, which is just defined as being uh, the logarithmic derivatives of the logarithm of the power spectrum times K cube divided by the logarithm of k. This is something that, for example, in the CMB, you can measure very well. So you would like to know what the theory prediction is. Now, if it weren't for the fact that h and epsilon have the secret k dependence, this would be 0, because I multiply times k cube is just a constant. But they do have this secret k dependence. And to evaluate this derivative, you should use, again, the chain rule, the fact that to leading order in slow roll, d log k well, d log of a h, which is approximately uh, d log a, which is d a over a, which is h. So 
So I can evaluate uh, the dependence on k here by trading it for a time dependence and calculate this derivative. And now I will get two terms. One when the, the derivative acts on h squared, and that gives me minus 2 epsilon. Not surprisingly, the time derivative of h is just epsilon. And then I have another time in which the time derivative acts on this epsilon. The derivative of epsilon is eta. So with the right coefficient is minus eta. So single field's low roll inflation actually predicts some amount of deviation from exact scale invariance, and this is the amount. The amount is small and is leading order in slow roll parameter, epsilon and eta. Probably already knew that. <laughs> okay. In passing, let me mention that this is also tell us a, a fun fact about uh, what is the power spectrum for a free scalar field in the sitter, which is always a good thing to know. Well, very roughly, that's easy to, to get because I told you here that this looks like a scalar field up to a factor of epsilon and a factor of two, actually a factor of two epsilon. A scalar field would be one half d phi d phi. So if I take away the factor of two epsilon, this power spectrum is one over two h squared over m Planck squared. Okay, it's just a good, good thing to know what is the power spectrum of a scalar field in the center. Okay, so, so this is for a scalar field. And I don't write that for nothing, but uh, because it's, it's useful in the, the last thing that I wanted to say, this is what the scalar part is, but I promise you to discuss also tensors. So let's write down what is the, the action of gravity at linearized, and actually Michele discussed that already this morning, so, uh, and he didn't have to solve any constraint, and the reason is that the constraint N and NI clearly do not contain any spin two field. So they cannot contribute to the action for the gravity. So forget about them, just take uh, einstein Hilbert action and expand it, and you get this. D i j d i j is the is this uh, tensor part of the metric, okay? Perhaps not surprisingly, it has the same action as a scalar himself as well, or herself, uh, except for a factor of uh, four or eight here. But okay, but we already said we know what is the power spectrum of a scalar, so we know the power spectrum of this. In principle, one could write a lot of interesting equation. I'm going to write just one, just to let to point yourself towards the fact that now there is one different, that this thing has two helicities plus spin, spin two, so it's plus and minus two, and usually people call the plus and the, and the, and the cross, and this is what Michele discussed uh, earlier this morning, and so we need to introduce a polarization tensor, okay, this is just a little bit of a detail. Now we're gonna quantize this thing in the same way that we did before. And this thing will appear like a scalar field, so the power spectrum is this, and I have two of them, so there's gonna be some factors of four flying around. So let me just give you the result, and then I'm gonna stop. Power, oh, oh, sorry, I sometimes I define this quantity because that's the one that is most commonly used by, by experiments. Uh, damn it. Uh, and this quantity is uh, 8 pi squared delta squared over k cubed. So people like to talk about this quantity rather than p, they talk about this. 
Okay, so the only difference is that I take out the K cube, which is obvious because they're all scale invariant, and there's this conventional factor of 8 pi square, which is just come from the angular integrals. So for R, when I do this trick, the result is... Um, oh, sorry. Pi squared. Well, for the tensors, uh, now uh, the correct result with all the factors of 2 So this is the main, uh, the main result of today, the power spectra, or if you want the normalization, the K-cube is the same, for the scalars, or for this adiabatic mode, and for the tensors. I'm gonna uh, close here, and I, I can take some, some questions. <laughs>